big pleasure this morning to co-chair this session, 360 degrees around uh, immunity conferred by SARS-CoV-2, COVID, coronavirus too, together with Professor um, Mary Hogan, who is an infectious disease specialist uh, at the Hospital of Cork, and who is also the president of the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland. And the star of this morning's presentation is Professor Peter Simmons, who is a professor in virology at Oxford University. And Peter is quite well known to all of us who, is working, who are working in the field of virology, as he is one of the world's scientific leaders within the field of evolution and epidemiology of virus infections and interactions with their hosts. Also, Peter is a member of the ICTV Executive Committee and thus closely involved in the ongoing development of virus classification methods and the assimilation of waste amount of new viral metagenomic data. Today's talk will focus on the more observational side of SARS coronavirus 2 infections and review the recent data on reinfection from the Hong Kong and Belgian studies, the reoccurrence and the persistence of the viral infections and the re recent data tried to model this on the behavior of seasonal coronaviruses. We are indeed very excited to have expert capacities like Peter presenting on our ECVID online conference. My name is Tia Fisher and I'm the Director of Clinical Research at the North Zealand Hospital and a Professor in Public Health, Virus Infections and Epidemics at the University of Copenhagen. Thank you, Peter. Welcome. The floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and I'm delighted to participate in what looks like a, a landmark meeting in uh, COVID-19 um, uh, clinical uh, and uh, virological um, research. Um, this is really comes at a crucial time uh, in, the, in Europe, especially with a second wave hitting many countries. And it's a really time that we understood more about how the disease and the works and how transmission occurs. So this study is sort of, as mentioned, observational in, in the sense that I'm just going to review some of the data about how the virus actually behaves and how we might sort of model this in, in relation to other uh, respiratory uh, viruses. Um, I'm going to just start with um, just some thoughts about the what we sort of imagine. Um, um, I'm just trying to change the next slide. Uh, um, infections to, to, um, to take place. Um, and really, in general, we've been applying a, an acute infection model uh, for SARS coronavirus 2. And this is really along the lines of influenza A virus or RSV um, that we're more familiar with. And the idea is that uh, acutely you'll be exposed, the virus would spread to the target organ, which in this case is the lung, and there would then be um, a strong immune response that would contain replication um, via a T cell and T cell, cytotoxic T cells and antibodies and development of mucosal immunity. And you would hope then that the virus would be cleared um, and associated with um, the formation of. Uh, T cell and B cell memory, and ideally immunity from reinfection. And this is sort of the model we imagine occurring for flu, uh, for um, RS, RSV, uh, rhinoviruses, and so on. And, and to an extent, this seems to be the case for um, uh, COVID-19 uh, and the behavior of the virus that causes it. Um, I would, however, just in this presentation, like to review slightly um, whether this really does fit well um, to what we actually see clinically. Uh, and the crucial question of whether infections really are acute. Um, how does the immune response work in, in, in SARS coronavirus 2 infections uh, compared to how it works, for example, against flu? Um, and most crucially, uh, is there a protective immunity or can reinfection occur? And this latter point is something that's been very recently addressed, and I'll review some of the evidence for reinfections. Um, to really look at the clinical data, um, I asked one of my students to do a, an in-depth literature review of the um, papers describing the course of SARS-CoV-2 infections 
in, in diagnosed cases of, of COVID-19. And, and this was done last month. Um, it used the standard sources and reviewed actually data from nearly 12,000 uh, patients um, with infections. Uh, we also looked at whether recurrence might occur, and, and this again involved a further set of uh, studies. Um, in, in presenting the evidence, we have to be aware of some publication bias. Um, we all are aware that um, papers that describe unexpected findings tend to get published, and those that report unexpected findings, findings uh, don't or, or aren't written. So we may be overestimating you know, the occurrences, particularly in case reports, which are very, very specialised uh, in, uh, incidents. Um, I suppose, on the other hand, we might underestimate duration of infections because it's just not looked at clinically very often. Um, uh, we have always assumed it's acute and therefore there's very little long-term follow-up of patients with uh, diagnosed COVID. And then finally, and uh, I'd have to say, I'm glad I'm not a Cochrane reviewer, but uh, all these studies that were reviewed have uh, wildly different metrics of how you measure duration, the sample types used and the study lengths. So what I'm going to show you is, is very much an approximation of what's there and you'd have to really look at the papers in detail to get more out of those. So here, here are 24 studies, or 26 studies that have actually followed up patients after acute infection. An idea here is to look at the sort of duration of shedding uh, in this column, so I'm showing mean or median values. Uh, there's a range for some studies or interquartile range for others, and then maximum durations here. And then some studies have estimated the frequency of shedding at different time points after the uh, diagnosis of COVID. Um, I think it's better to show this on a graph. And this graph on the right actually shows a median or mean uh, durations of shedding after COVID-19 um, by PCR. So this is with the uh, red diamonds actually show this. And actually, you know, if you look at this, you can see it's quite long. Um, the median perhaps for all these studies is around 20 to 30 days. Um, the bars show the range and you can see this can be highly prolonged up to 50, 60 days in, in some of the studies I published. Uh, and just to put this into um, context, um, at the bottom, here are two studies investigating the same phenomenon in RSV infections in influenza A using uh, the same type of diagnostic criteria uh, uh, and methods. And I think it just highlights how dramatically shorter the standard respiratory virus infection is compared to SARS coronavirus 2. We've reviewed some of the studies also on recurrence. And uh, again, these are slightly varied in how they are done in terms of what's measured in relation to COVID diagnosis. Um, but essentially, um, you can look at the frequency where they are reported, uh, the interval, mean or median interval over which recurrence was observed, which can be quite long, and the kind of range in observation periods. And we can plot all this onto a graph. So this shows the um, durations of, of um, um, or, or the frequencies of positivity at different time points uh, post-infection for recurrent positivity and then the intervals between recurrence of positivity. And you can see there's a sort of fairly long-term long trend here, so it's obviously going down. Um, I wouldn't like to try and fit a line through this, but it may, for example, be a straight line, and it turns out that everybody clears at day 60. I suspect, though, it'll be more curved, and there may well be a subset of individuals who show much, much longer-term persistence. And, and clearly, we need longer studies than have been published so far to establish this. Okay, um, the other phenomenon which has really come up very recently has been the uh, observation of reinfection. And I think the first study published in a peer reviewed journal was uh, from Hong Kong by To et al. And um, this describes an immunocompetent male, which is obviously significant in terms of the immunology, um, a mild infection, and then purely by chance on uh, random screening at an airport actually was found to be positive again 142 days later after the primary diagnosis. Um, and the important point was that the viruses from the original sample and from the airport sample were sequenced and shown to be phylogenetically distinct. So clearly there'd been some uh, evidence for, for reinfection. 
Uh, as with other studies, there wasn't really any good serology, so we don't know whether this patient had a poor uh, T or B cell response, and perhaps he didn't have neutralizing antibodies at the time of reinfection. Um, there's a similar uh, description from a study in Belgium, um, uh, Van Islander, um, again, in a competent individual. In this case, there was a moderately severe primary disease, so clearly you would expect there to have been a decent immune response to infection uh, at that time. Uh, but it was then found there was a reinfection uh, within three months that was actually symptomatic um, and potentially uh, uh, in infectious. Uh, again, this, this was sequence confirmed. Um, the ECDC have convened an expert group and they very recently reported uh, a, a sort of very nice review of cases and some uh, guidance on how to establish um, re reinfections um, and, and also some um, uh, advice about how, how to deal with this. Um, so um, just to put some of the data from that report together, they actually report a total of six cases, including the two I've just shown you, but there have been further ones described in the States, Ecuador and two in India. And broadly, they conform to this sort of protocol where we have a positive initially, an intermediate negative sample, a second positive, um, and then usually, or I think in these cases, in all cases, sequence evidence that actually the virus strains were distinct and it does represent a reinfection. So clearly this will occur. And obviously I think there has been a huge lack of follow-up to establish how often uh, this, this actually does, does happen. Um, and El Pais, the newspaper in Spain, uh, have actually reported further instances of this. These, I don't think there's in the literature yet, but these are four cases. And in one case, the reinfection uh, that occurred um, ended up with the patient going to ITU. So clearly it can be severe and past infection does not protect you either necessarily from infection or from the recurrence of severe disease. Um, so um, this obviously occurs and, and it's interesting to imagine, you know, this could be a much more common phenomenon than we had uh, appreciated previously and it doesn't all go very well for development of protective immunity. Just again, to put this into context, um, we can compare this data with what we know for the seasonal coronaviruses. Um, so there are four of these. These have been well known for decades and they have generally been considered to be acute resolving infections, normally associated with very mild or asymptomatic uh, respiratory disease. Um, the data for follow-up for these is very limited. A lot of the work was done many decades ago without PCR. And so the duration of shedding hasn't really been very clearly established other than by virus isolation. What I'm going to do is just review a paper that was published three years ago, long before SARS coronavirus 2 came along. But in this case, they actually followed up patients with NL63 um, infections uh, over several months in the index patients and family contacts. Um, so it was done in rural Kenya. There's a guy called James Noakes who works in the Welcome Centre in Khalifa who did the study. Um, and essentially it involved testing diagnostic samples um, for coronaviruses. Uh, and like many other groups, they found initial detection rates that was quite low, 1.3%. Uh, so 75 out of 5,500 screen samples. Um, what was remarkable, though, that when the same patients were screened three or four months later, 21% were positive. Um, so this is much higher than the initial rate. Um, the um, authors at that time, when they wrote the paper, suggested that perhaps these represent reinfections, perhaps, you know, within family contacts and so on. But one of the strange things was, though, when they sequenced the viruses at the start and in the follow-up sample, they always found it was the same clade of NL63, uh, which is more than you'd expect by chance. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, having spoken to James Noakes, who I know very well, he, he kind of said that perhaps looking at this again, then this may actually be more consistent with uh, long-term shedding rather than reinfection. Um, and again, it sort of puts it very much in the ballpark of what we can see for SARS coronavirus too, after all. 
And um, again, we can see that they actually reported the same for uh, OC43 and 2290 in the same study at slightly lower recurrence frequencies. So very interesting. Um, there's been a, a further study published from uh, Holland, um, Edridge et al, um, which didn't do any virology, but essentially they made use of long-term follow-up um, from a previous established HIV cohort. These were actually immunocompetent HIV negative subjects who were then tested over many years from the freezer trawl that they had uh, in, in Amsterdam. And so uh, the, the technique they used was to look at uh, zero reactivity to the four seasonal coronaviruses. Um, and <clears throat> in this case, they interpreted these spikes in antibody reactivity shown on the right as evidence for reinfection. So they don't have any virological data, but clearly these upticks in, in reactivity in the ELISA suggest that there's been some form of reinfection or recurrence. And um, looking at the group as a whole, there was very frequent uh, recurrence or, or or um, reinfection with each of the four coronaviruses um, over time <coughs> with intervals that might range from a year right out through to five or six years. Um, so again, this doesn't really fit the mold of a, an acute infection that's cleared with protective immunity. So I think kind of the analogy with seasonal coronaviruses suggests that actually uh, they too may not be conforming to the standard acute model. Um, I just want to very briefly review what's known for other coronaviruses. Um, and in fact, you know, in general, uh, there are many veterinary viruses and the, the common finding for these is that they are persistent, um, particularly bovine coronaviruses and cows, it's enteric. You get long-term shedding in, in feces and that may be related to uh, the persistent presence of, of the virus infection in cattle herds. Um, Murine hepatitis virus is a lab model. Um, it's a model for, for many things, including looking at immunopathology. Um, again, it's obviously assumed known to be persistent. Feline coronaviruses and various bird viruses. Porcine coronaviruses, there are several that are persistent. Um, some that have been more recently acquired tend to be acute. And again, this is sort of looking at the, the clue as to what SARS coronavirus do, doing as hum in humans. And then finally, it's very difficult to do long-term follow-up in bats. But certainly field studies where they look at fecal shedding um, show that they can find very high rates of detection uh, cross-sectionally in, in, in bat populations with certain SARS-related viruses. And, and clearly this can't be acute infection. Similarly for camels, there are certain groups of camels which actually show up to 40% positivity in respiratory samples. So again, for camels, it looks like MERS coronavirus can, can, can show long-term persistence as well. Um, so I, I just want to just take a small virological excursion into other studies in, in, of RNA virus persistence. You know, we imagine that DNA viruses are the persistent ones and RNA viruses are acute. Obviously, that's not true for hep C. And it turns out that actually there are many persistent RNA viruses where how it, they achieve this in relation to the immune system isn't really understood. One of the observations my group made many years ago, and this is really my interest, is, is that for plus strand RNA viruses like hep C and certain coronaviruses, uh, there seems to be an association between the configuration of the genome and its ability to persist. And what we have observed is that the RNA intensively folds in the genome um, to form complex RNA structures. Um, and um, these can be quantified by a metric called MFEDS. Uh, I could show you some references later on. But essentially, the MFEDS scale on this graph on the right actually indicates the degree of folding of, of the genome. Um, and on this graph, it's analysis of many mammalian uh, and avian RNA viruses. Um, I've basically uh, ranked them by their MFEDS score and then color coded them by whether they are able to persist will not persist. Um, and there seems a very clear separation. So hepatitis C is uh, way over on the right here, along with foot and mouth uh, copy viruses uh, and, and, and certain Khaleesi viruses. And on the left, we have the enteroviruses, parechos, all the other viruses and so on. So there seems to be a very clear distinction. We don't at this stage understand how that association works, but, but it's been very obvious for many years. <laughs> So my interest was to look at whether coronaviruses are structured and um, the outcome really from this is that they are. So this is a, 
similar y-axis scale. Um, these are the data from the previous slide shown as a scatter plot. So these are the persistent viruses with the high MPEG values, non-persistent, low MPEG values. And these are the results for coronaviruses. So this is the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronavirus genera. Um, and then the SARS-like viruses on the left. So here's SARS coronavirus 2. So it has an extremely high MPEG value, uh, even in relation to hep C. Hep C is around about 8-9%. Um, SARS coronavirus is much higher than that. And so actually, it turns out that all the other coronavirus infecting humans and definitely animals are also structured. So there's SARS coronavirus, OC43, MERS coronavirus, and so on. So at least as a prediction that would be consistent with the idea that actually coronaviruses might be able to persist. Um, in terms of what the structure is, it's quite bizarre uh, looking at it. Um, here's a section of the genome and um, just sort of substantiate these MFED predictions. Essentially, this, the RNA is intensively folded into sequential stem loops all the way through all the genes of, of, the, of the coding sequence of the virus. Um, it's conserved to a, a degree with SARS coronavirus. Um, this is the original one. So we see stem loops in the same place, but actually the pairings have evolved considerably between the two, so they don't precisely match in pairing identities. Um, we can visualize this in various ways, and um, the transformation plot shows the tops of the stem loops uh, across the, the entire genome of SARS coronavirus uh, 2. And remarkably, we end up with bioinformatic evidence, which is largely confirmed by uh, biochemical probing that there are at least 600 or more discrete stem loops in the genome of the virus. And uh, two, over 2,000 separate duplex, duplex regions and more than three bases of pairing. Um, and most bases in the genome are actually paired. It's, it's absolutely remarkable compared to what we imagine our, an RNA genome to be like. As mentioned, we, we don't know how this works, but we suspect that this influences the interaction of the uh, virus with uh, the host uh, cellular response and perhaps the compaction of the RNA reduces interaction with pattern recognition receptors. So just in conclusion then, uh, for the end of the talk, um, there is evidence for some quite substantial persistence reactivation. Um, there seems to be prolonged shedding in the respiratory tracts in, in many individuals in, infected with the virus. And then we have to look at this whole issue of ineffective in immunity. Um, and how the virus can seems to be able to relatively easily reinfect individuals even after severe infection with a what would have been at the time probably a reasonable uh, measurable immune response. I should stress so that the persistence that we potentially can see may not be the reason for long-term symptoms. We don't know whether um, long-haul symptoms uh, such as malaise uh, and so on related to the presence of virus, perhaps it's a, a long-term immunopathology um, associated with past infection. Um, and of course, the other factor is, is there's a huge amount now being looked at in terms of the type of immune response that occurs uh, on infection uh, and whether there are any specific immune defects that actually prevent um, an effective T-cell response developing and antibody uh, assisting. And then very finally, I just want to sort of just sort of run through um, how SARS coronavirus 2 uh, compares with an, an acute virus, influenza A, and a, and a persistent virus like hep C, which is unstructured and structured. And um, again, they both, all three cause acute, but in the case of hep C, obviously there is a delayed and often partial clearance and perhaps persistence in about 6% or more of those who are exposed. In contrast, flu is, is, is obviously invariably cleared by, by the immune system uh, and there's a powerful T-cell response that's responsible for that. Um, with sars cov virus 2 it's a bit less clear. There's obviously a T-cell response and neutralizing antibody uh, detection. Um, but we do know that there is some disorder of cytokine production and energy of T-cells in severe cases. Uh, energy is actually a feature of hep C. The T-cells initially work in acute infection with hep C but the T cells that actually develop on infection then become energic and don't function. And in hep C, there's no real uh, neutralizing antibody response. Uh, in terms of reinfection, in flu, there is long-term immunity. You only really get reinfection with an antigenically distinct virus. In, in hep C, 
when you clear hep C, you're equally susceptible to the reinfection as you were if you'd never been exposed in the first place, which is remarkable, um, but it's true. Um, and then perhaps with SARS coronavirus 2, we don't really know, but clearly we can see a reinfection occurring. Uh, and then in terms of transmission, acute phase only for flu. Transmission of hep C occurs during persistence, and for SARS coronavirus 2, we don't know. So I'll just leave it at that and I'd like to thank very much uh, Sarah Williams, who did the uh, work on the literature review. Um, many contributors to my group in terms of persistence and what we understand about that uh, below. Uh, and Heli Harvler, who's really been driving the, the project uh, and trying to apply it uh, more clinically. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, a fantastic talk. I won't say a bit depressing, but um, I'm an optimist. Um, there is a lot of questions. I'm trying to summarize some of them. Um, when uh, people are reinfected, are they likely to have fewer symptoms and be less infectious? And would that, like a low CT value, um, relate with non-infectivity? Yes, I mean, that, that's really a, a sort of key point. Uh, for reinfections, obviously, there are the six reports. Uh, certainly, in, in one case, infection, reinfection was associated with very severe disease and ITU admission, and, and clearly such an individual would and certainly be infectious, uh, you would imagine. Um, there's a bit later, less data for the others uh, in terms of viral loads. Um, so I think it's unclear. I think the outcomes can, can be quite... Uh, substantial. Um, in terms of persistence though, um, the common observation is that CT values are much higher, so uh, even though there may be long-term shedding, um, the, the viral loads are, are obviously lower uh, and may be associated with non-transmissibility. Non Various people have argued that because the patients at that point have neutralizing antibodies, then perhaps the virus is, is actually um, non-infectious uh, for that reason. So I, th I think that's unclear, but it, it, it's an absolutely key point in terms of public health and containment. And uh, given that, you know, you, you, there are six case reports, um, we'd probably see more, but the numbers are very low, given that there's been 30 million cases worldwide. Yeah. So is it something about the genetic makeup of the people, or is it just because we're not looking for it because they're asymptomatic? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we have to wait the genetic studies to, to, to see, uh, you know, obviously a huge number of groups doing SNP studies to look at the relationship between infection and severity. Um, there's no real conclusion from that at the moment, uh, as I'm aware, but um, again, you would really want to look at the same type of approach potentially for those who show long-term shedding as well. It may be related to severity, but it may, may be different. It's okay. unclear. Um, there's another question. Um, taking the analogy to seasonal coronaviruses and the examples of long-term shedding into account, what do you expect from SARS-CoV-2 uh, with regards to pandemic, which runs its natural course or in the presence of a vaccine? Will we continue to battle the virus year after year with the same intensity and degree of severity due to persistent infections in the absence of effective and safe vaccines? Well, that is that would be one implication, uh, which I, I don't want to firmly predict. It's either way. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, there is prolonged infection. Um, whether the persistence really takes a form of long-term transmissibility and, and ongoing, you know, uh, presence in the community is, isn't clear. Um, I, th I think, you know, by analogy with some of the veterinary coronaviruses. Recently, zoonotic viruses tend not to be very persistent. It needs a degree of host adaptation for it to occur. And perhaps host adaptation may be then associated with a reduced um, severity of disease. It's very interesting that uh, OC43 was perhaps responsible for a previous almost pandemic of infection in, in late uh, 1900s, 1800s. Um, um, and again, it's, it's infection severity seems to modulate it since then. So perhaps this may just be an example of something that has actually occurred before as well, historically. Okay, Th thank you very much. We're, we're uh, keeping strictly to time. A fantastic talk. Um, thanks to you, Peter. Thanks to Thea.
and uh, Salome in the background, who's uh, keeping us all uh, in, in on time. Uh, thanks very much again. Thanks to the chairs, thank you.